The Diabetes Podcast is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease. Please do not apply any of this information without first speaking to your doctor. And welcome back, fellow Die Buddies, to the Die Buddies podcast. Uh, today is a super great interview, and I'm so excited uh, to have Don Muchow here on the podcast. He's uh, recently broken some some records uh, in the United States, and uh, he's he's a great guy, and I'm very excited to have him on this podcast. Uh, a little bit of background on him is that he and his wife helped run a digital agency, but um, he is an ultra marathoner most recently to the extreme, especially as a type one diabetic. Um, you know, so Don, it's great to have you on the podcast and we appreciate you sharing some time with here with us. It's good to be here. So I first ran into you and your story while you were finishing this run. So the, the run you just recently completed was, um, you know, a journey you embarked on running from Pacific to the Atlantic. You know, some people were, were calling it uh, Disneyland and Disney World or mouse to mouse. Uh, was that the initial intention was to run mouse to mouse or how did how did you even accomplish thinking about running such a such a race and such a mileage? Um, it was originally intended as a run from Los Angeles to the Space Coast. Uh, mm. The reason for that was that it was the flattest, shortest route I could find between two oceans that wasn't <laughs> disputed by anybody. Um, yeah. Um, by that, I mean that there are some people who would run from California to the Gulf of Mexico and call themselves done because after all, there's an ocean there. Um, but most of the folks in the transcontinental running community go, no, that's only halfway across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was the flattest, shortest route I could find because I don't like hills. Um, <laughs> and I was explaining the run to a friend of mine a while back. And I said, okay, so I'm running from Los Angeles to the Space Coast. And he said, uh, so Anaheim to Orlando, Disneyland to Disney World. And I'm like, no, but that's brilliant. Let me mm. write that down. And uh, we really didn't know when we started, um, especially when we hit Anaheim and did a quick selfie in front of Disneyland, that it was going to generate the amount of tension, the amount of attention for um, the message I wanted to bring out about diabetes and exercise and the, the challenges and the rewards uh, for folks like us. Um, didn't realize I was going to get that kind of attention until we got closer to Disney and the Disney fan base basically lit up the airwaves with this stuff. Mm -hmm. And we were fielding calls from multiple TV stations. And when we got to, by the time we got to Disney World, it was a major event for them. So um, I'm really pleased that we had the opportunity to bring a high profile to the message and uh, to do kind of a first of uh, for Disneyland to Disney World run. Yeah. Did it did it start out like did you go into this thinking that this is going to be for diabetes or was this one of those things where like, hey, I want to run really far across the country and eh, let's add diabetes into this? Um, it's most definitely something that's personally meaningful to me. Um, I did not start. Uh, running or really any kind of exercise until 2004. Uh, and if memory serves me correctly, I was 42 at the time. I was having a, a shortness of breath, walking upstairs, things like that. And, and my mind played out a very dark sort of mini movie of, you know, the guy who works really hard at his job and then dies of a heart attack with a gold watch. And, mm. um, I had just started in 2004 being physically active. Uh, I had already signed up for a 5K turkey trot. And I got news from my retina specialist that I had proliferative uh, retinopathy from years of poor control of my type 1. And about the time that that sort of put the fear of God into me, um, I ran across a couple of friends who were type one and were runners. And I said, okay, looks like I got to do something. Cycling is too expensive. I don't know how to swim. So you guys teach me how to run. Mm. And they gave me uh, lots of love and attention, basically shepherded me 
from 5Ks to marathons and said, so this is how you do it. And by the way, we're still figuring it out. We're type ones as well. And mm -hmm. there's no secret way to do this. You just kind of have to stumble and get back up. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to pay it forward when we did the US run. That would I would say that that was 90% of my reason. Um, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a little bit of ego involved. Um, I'm, a, mm -hmm. I'm a marketing guy, so I know when something draws attention to me. Sure. Um, but that wasn't the primary reason. Mm. Um, as time wore on, I began to realize that it wasn't just paying forward the message that exercise is a good thing. I mean, we all kind of know that. But the fact that it's hard for folks like us um, living with type one to start doing that when exercise by its very nature drops blood sugar sometimes uh, quite precipitously. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's a single one of us alive who has started being physically active, who hasn't thought, oh my God, am I going to die in my sleep? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's a very hard fear to get past. Mm -hmm. And when we met people on the run uh, all across the country, um, they told us the same story. I'm a, I was afraid to do this. I've only just now started. I don't know how, you know, do you mind if I send you an email and ask you some questions about this when you're done with the run? And more than anything, that's why I did it because mm -hmm. I wanted to start those conversations and I wanted somebody to ask me the same questions I asked my two friends back in 2004. Wow. So when you, Started in 2004, did you ever think you'd be running over 2,700 miles at one point in your life? No, I did not. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, just happy to finish the 5K. Mm. I, um, I remember when I did that race, my wife ran with me. And there was one point at which I sort of outran myself because I was running like a kid, you know, as fast as I could until I couldn't breathe. And she said, why don't you slow down and take this in little pieces? Mm. And that's been the single most valuable piece of advice that got me to doing transcontinental runs is if something gets hard, cut it into smaller pieces, then try swallowing it. Mm. You know, um, just about anything is possible. If you break it down into stuff, you know how to do. Mm. Yeah, I love I love that message, you know, just take a step back and, and and to really digest it and literally which is what chewing is you're taking in smaller pieces to digest it better right exactly um so as you are learning to well first of all i almost want to commend you just some picking running up in your 40s um running's interesting sport in that you know the more advanced uh, and wiser decades you get into your life uh, the better you are actually at it, it seems, you know, with the more experienced runners, but very few people in their forties will take on a new task and a new challenge um, to say, let me, you know, let me do something different with my life than the past couple of decades. So, you know, you measured, measured or mentioned the retinopathy uh, going on. So what was that? What are those moments like, you know, what you said, it really kind of shook you with a, you know, the gold watch, but Prior to that, you know, how, what was really the fear of exercise? Was it with the lows or and then reflection? Is it, was it something deeper than that? Um, I think it was primarily the, the fear that lows would, would basically render me unconscious. Um, for anyone in your audience who isn't type one and being at Die Buddies podcast, the chances are not that good that they're not type one, but <laughs> um, the fear is very real. Um, mm. When people go low, um, they tend for whatever reason to experience symptoms very similar to an adrenaline rush. Uh, and it's not in a pleasant way. I tell mm. people that um, if you take the feeling you get when you blow through an intersection, running a red light and nearly T-bone somebody, and now stretch that out over 30 minutes. Yeah. That's what it feels like to experience a low. Um, it's very visceral. It's a very gut level fear. You mm -hmm. don't want to feel like you almost T-boned somebody over and over and over again because your sugar is low. And so most of us tend to, quote, get it up where we can see it, you know, mm -hmm. 150, 180. Um, and uh, while I know that tight control is an ideal, 
Uh, running at 180 all of the time is just not a good thing. Um, it still produces long-term consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps not, you know, the amputation and blindness, but, um, you know, bits of neuropathy, um, other things that are very unpleasant to experience. And it's not a great way to spend the rest of your life. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad that you touched on that because when people are, you know, when I've interacted with other diabetics that are, whether it's a sporting event or some kind of high pressure moment, you know, the safety is, oh, I'd rather be 170, 180, which is absolutely true in an acute situation, but especially running long distances and running long distances over time kind of hits home the fact that if you are high, even like the 170, 180 range for an extended period of time, that's still like, I'm glad that you highlighted that will bring um, increase of damage and oxidative stress to your body. Because um, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, you know, we're kind of damned if we do can damned if we don't kind of thing. And most people don't recognize how hard that actually is of a balancing act. Um, you're absolutely right about that. Um, just as a side note, and I'll keep it brief in case um, it's not where you want to take the conversation, but um, after a particularly stressful day that involved sugars running high all day long uh, during my crossing of Texas, uh, followed by a severe low um, middle of the night, the next, the next, the next uh, morning, um, I became very interested in the effects of stress as they relate to blood glucose management. And some of the things that you think are true or that one is tempted to think are true aren't necessarily true. Mm -hmm. um, people tell you if your sugars are running high, dose them down. Well, that's great. If you're not experiencing stress, that's good advice. If you're experiencing stress, though, getting extra insulin is going to shove the glycogen that your liver just released back into the liver, but you're still experiencing the stress and stress is going to produce more glycogen dumping and you get in this vicious cycle of dosing and not eating. And basically it's not doing your body any good. And really the problem that should be solved is getting rid of the stress. Um, you know, stress does incredible damage on the body and um, something that a lot of non-diabetic runners don't think about is that uh, if they go all David Goggins and turn it into a suffer fest on purpose, mm -hmm. they're doing damage to their body that they may not want to live with the consequences of and be pushing themselves to the edge of rhabdo, just as an example. Mm -hmm. And um, we're fortunate with type one in that we can see immediately in our blood glucose levels, what the effects of stress are. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that if my blood sugar is high and I haven't eaten anything, eaten anything uh, rich in carbs, chances are pretty good. It's either a bad infuser or it's stress. And, you know, if it's, if it's been a good infuser for the last 10 hours, my vote's going to be on stress. And I try to manage the stress. Wow. So what are, uh, uh, that observation seems both while running and, and outside of running, uh, would I be, was that a far stretch in, in that assumption then? I, I think that's true in general. Um, yeah. you know, you think about the fact that if people experience a death in the family, one of the things that folks do at the funeral is bring food. And I think it's natural because people uh, stress eat mm -hmm. and eating uh, stimulates the um, parasympathetic nervous system and sort of t gets your body to calm down. Um, unfortunately, it also raises blood sugar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, that's the challenge with type one is when should you eat and dose? When should you dose and not eat? And when should you eat and not dose? Mm -hmm. um, and you've got three chances to get it wrong. And only one of those is right <laughs> at any given moment. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. So kind of kind of riding that storm or kind of riding the wave rather. So um, I see or I read that you use the, the Dexcom, the T-Slim system. That a yes. lot, you know, how is, um, in particular, I'm really curious on, on how you use the T slim and that closed loop system on this run in particular, uh, cause I know they have an exercise mode, but you you were literally a, would be pushing that to the extreme, uh, for many consecutive days. So what is your experience with that technology and that type of exercise? Um, when I started to run across the U S uh, I ran, uh, just in normal mode, primarily because 
I didn't want to get in a loop of trying to tap my body's own energy sources. Um, I was not looking to lose weight. Um, first of all, I was at, at my target weight, more or less. Uh, mm -hmm. I, right now, I weigh about 152 to 155. And um, it's not a typical on a run across the U.S. to, to lose in the neighborhood of 30 pounds. Wow. Um, wow. It's just almost impossible, even at four to 5,000 calories a day, to take on enough energy to do the run. And so I wanted to leave my pump configured in normal mode so that I could eat and dose and take that fuel on board uh, rather than trying to break my body down for fuel or do something like that. Um, that was successful for about a week. Mm. Um, then I found that I had to run it in exercise mode because of increased insulin sensitivity. Um, I didn't want um, large automatic boluses to be delivered. And uh, by the time I was three or four weeks into it, there's your dramatic uh, sound effects in the background. <laughs> We're going to have a severe thunderstorm watch right now. Oh, wow. Um, wow. Yeah, I, I love the sound effects, though. <laughs> um, what I found after about three weeks was that I had to run it in sleep mode all the time. Mm. Uh, sleep mode basically being uh, a setting where it'll adjust your basal rate, maybe make it a little bit higher if you're running a little high, but it won't. It actually won't bolus. us. Um, and uh, I found that sleep mode worked best for super long, you know, 10 hours a day cardio, day after day after day. Mm -hmm. um, as the saying goes, though, your diabetes may vary. Yeah. 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 So because you're running on average 33 miles a day, every day, right. every day. So that alone, just a 33 mile in one day, most people can't even comprehend trying to dose their insulin. Um, but let alone trying to balance that for multiple consecutive days and weeks. Um, what well, you know, when I run my marathons, I find that yeah, if I get over the first hour, you know, changing the basal rates work really well, but I've never even tipped my toes in the water in that type of mileage and, and consecutive days. So what, so were you dropping low a lot that first week and week and a half that you were just trying to use the, you know, regular mode then? I was getting indications that, you know, it was 98 or 100 and that was in the middle of a three mile stretch and I needed to do another two miles on the fuel that I just took on. And I could tell that the 30 grams of carbs or the, you know, the, the, the uh, sometimes I would mix carb rich foods like Oreos um, uh, with a chicken salad just to get some protein and fat on board. And it didn't seem to matter what I ate. I was running, I was about to run low. Um, and my experience was that, you know, a lot of the time, if you balance things perfectly, you can go out and run a marathon and your sugar will be a hundred all day long because the insulin is coming on board just as the food is. But the feeling I had that a little bit of adrenaline in the background told me that, no, this is an oncoming low. This isn't just, you know, I'm, I'm dancing on the high wire just the right way and keeping things in balance. And sure enough, a couple times I tried to push it and uh, my sugar would go low. And that was enough of a confirmation to me that I really needed to either take more food on board or come up with a better dosing strategy. Mm. So how, oh, sorry, Brady, you can go ahead. Yeah. So like when you'd run into those situations, um, how was it, how was it set up? Were you carrying things that would save you or did you have your wife driving behind you? How did that all work? Um, I always carried um, a fairly plentiful amount of fast carbs on board. Um, I usually had two uh, glucose shots in my pocket. I may have one handy, this sort of thing. Oh, um, yeah. Um, and uh, about 15 grams each. Uh, that, those seem to act the fastest. Mm -hmm. And um, I also had probably half a dozen runner's gels in my pockets at any one point. Most of the time I didn't need to tap into that. Um, sometimes I tapped into it to treat lows. Sometimes I tapped into it because I was on a, you know, eight mile stretch of the with Lacucci trail in Florida. And, uh, there was no way that the van was going to be able to get to me. So I needed to have that stuff handy. 
Mm. Um, you raise an interesting point though, which is that for type ones, carrying enough fuel is not just one of those handy things that you stuff in your ultra vest. Mm. Um, it's like, okay, did we, did we fuel up the airplane before we take off? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because you know, get up there and you don't have any fuel, it's like the propeller stops and that's, that's it for you. Yeah. So, um, we were very careful about that. Um, from experience with running Texas, Leslie, uh, had the van supplied with literally everything we could possibly need in a situation like that all the way from, uh, fast carbs to glucagon. And we had, we had hoarded glucagon. So we had multiple glucagon rescue kits. Hmm. Um, the thing about glucagon basically is that if I understand it in my layman's, uh, terms, it basically makes your liver dump glycogen. And once it does that, there ain't no more, <laughs> certainly not much more. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, I call, tell people sometimes it's liquid marathon because it basically makes you hit the wall instantly. Wow. And, um, uh, so using glucagon is kind of an emergency thing. Um, if you're going to be getting up and running the next day, um, basically any day that I had to have glucagon, which was only once going across Texas. And I think, I, I don't forget if I used it at all in the U S run it, invariably the next day had to be a rest day and, you know, high carb consumption and, and all that stuff just to get my liver refilled. You know, I've never actually thought about it and that, that perspective, but yeah, no, you're right in the mechanism. Um, and you're right in why that would simulate hitting the wall. Um, you know, I've never had personally had to use glucagon and in reality, there's not a whole lot of actual data out there. You know, the stories between people in the community of using it but in terms of there's not a whole lot of research and, and the utilization of glucagon not, not alone, and let alone utilization of glucagon in an ultra distance runner. And so, um, wow, that, that, that's literally a liquid wall. That is exactly what that is. Pretty that's much. Not, yeah. That's crazy. So you had to use it once in Texas and I think and, so. And you, you were you just sluggish that rest of the day and that run or how'd you get through that? Um, exact run? So, so what happened on that day? Um, I was on a stretch of Texas Highway 302 between Kermit and Odessa. Uh, this was back uh, 10 days into the run in uh, 2019. So it would have been uh, uh, probably mid-March. Um, that particular stretch of road is affectionately known as the most dangerous road in Texas. Uh, it typically has 70 mile an hour, uh, oil, oil field equipment, uh, trucks with oil field equipment. So mm -hmm. almost every load is a wide load. Um, people have said that it seems to be where people go to drive right after they get their CDLs. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it is like Mad Max out there. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had a 41 miles to cover between Kermit and Odessa. Um, I tried to run when there wasn't any traffic. We started pre-dawn, uh, and we got about six miles outside of Odessa and I had been fighting highs the whole day, uh, and not eating and, um, finally decided to get some insulin. And when we got into Odessa, which was right around sunset, um, we went directly to dinner. This was pre COVID and, uh, we went directly to dinner and we were sitting in the restaurant and, uh, I experienced one of the things that a lot of ultra runners experience, which is a loss of appetite. So I dosed for dinner. I didn't eat much of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I had been stress high all day long. And when I got back to the hotel room, I realized that, you know, I dosed for like 35 grams, not a lot, uh, at dinner, but it was way too much. It was way too much. I maybe ate 15 grams of it. And on a normal day, that wouldn't have been too bad because, you know, I would have somewhere out there like normal people, I would have, would have hit the wall and dumped some glycogen or what, uh, not hit the wall, but, um, gotten to the point right before the wall where I dumped some liver glycogen. But so I, I had dumped a fair bit of glycogen. I had run high all day long, got home. The stress was removed. My blood sugar dropped like a rock. And, um, I remember s sort of sitting half dazed in the bed 
trying to convince my wife after consuming close to 100 grams of carbs that I was going to stay conscious. And she said, we're not going to play that game. I'm going to give you the glucagon and we'll deal with it tomorrow. And she gave me the glucagon and I, I, my sugar finally normalized. It never did go back up real high. Mm. So, I mean, I actually needed some hundred grams, not counting the 20 or so I probably dosed for that I didn't get. So, you know, I was probably 80 grams short, which is pretty close to a full liver's worth if, if I understand how that all works. And um, never did lose consciousness, but I came really close. I had visual whiteouts. And the next day we thought, okay, well, you know, 6 a.m. alarm goes off, we're getting ready to run. And I'm just like, I can't, I, I don't have it in me. I don't have any energy. We we're gonna take a rest once we got to the next big town anyway. And uh, we just decided to take a rest day in Odessa. When we did Texas, we weren't real familiar with the idea of rest days every 10 days. Um, so we, we took our first rest day 10 days in, which was perfect. And then the next one, I think it was in uh, Fort Worth for, for weather. Um, but since Texas, we take rest days every 10 days. We don't do anything to tap into my uh, onboard glycogen stores because I'll need those in an emergency. So we're very conscious about, you know what? I, it, you know, if you need to eat some more, eat some more. But, uh, you know, let's don't play this game where we reduce basal and all that other stuff to try to, um, to get my sugar to, to get my body to, to use, you know, stored fat for energy. I do that anyway. Um, mm -hmm. But forcing me into that just sort of uh, turns me catabolic and, and puts me at greater risk of things like rhabdo. Wow. Uh, have you had rhabdo while, while on these long ultra runs? Uh, no, but I've come really close. Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, I'm trying to think how I would describe the, the I know that it's primarily determined by a, a kidney test. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, it's sort of the Coca-Cola, you know, what color is your urine? Mm -hmm. um, at least uh, in a non-clinical fashion. Um, and uh, if it comes out like Coca-Cola, you need an ambulance. Um, but there are other symptoms short of that. Um, I would call um, sort of almost a soul tired kind of fatigue um, the feeling that you just can't push your muscles any farther. Um, there's something about breaking down muscle tissue for energy that leaves you with this feeling that's somewhere between, between fatigue and a muscle cramp. Um, it, it's just like you feel like if you push yourself any farther, you don't know what they would do. Um, uh, for me, my mood gets incredibly uh, sour and pessimistic and like we're all going to die. And, um, I, uh, I run a fever, uh, typically in that situation and, uh, best I can figure what's happening on board. And this is once again, not from a clinical perspective is that my body's broken down myoglobin. Um, my, uh, uh, blood vessels have dilated a little bit to allow the, the, uh, protein to be emptied from th through the capillaries from the muscles and so forth. Um, my immune system looks at that broken down myoglobin and says, what the hell is that? That mm -hmm. looks foreign. That's, that's not a protein I recognize and uh, kicks in with, you know, all the various um, reactive interleukins and produces an inflammatory response. And um, meanwhile, that muscle, that broken down myoglobin is getting emptied through the kidneys. And um, in most cases, you're dehydrated to start with and, it's, uh, it's just like nothing works anymore. And um, I'm very happy that I haven't gotten in a situation where I've done permanent damage to my kidneys, but, you know, given what they've been through, I don't want to push them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially being type one diabetes, we, all, we have to worry about that a lot anyways. Yeah. Now, my understanding of how that all works clinically may be extremely messed up, but from an athlete's perspective, that's what it feels like to me anyway. Yeah. So 
you know, we, we spent a little bit of time right now talking about some scary things and some negative things about running distance and, and diabetes. But, um, you know, with these ultra runs specifically, you know, this U.S. run um, and any run you've had in the past, what are some uh, can you share maybe a story or two of you successfully like controlling your sugar on a run? Like, wow, like I overcame that obstacle. I didn't think I would. And things ended up pretty good. Um, on the U.S. run, I actually did not have a lot of problems with control. Um, a little bit amazing because I was basically on the same pump that I used when I was crossing Texas. Um, I started on uh, Basal IQ, the uh, non-dosing um, reactive management loop system, whatever you want to call it, that Tandem had. Um, the difference between Basal IQ and Control IQ is that Control IQ will adjust your basal rate up or bolus if it sees you running high or at risk of running high based on its algorithm. And um, I did not pick up using control IQ until after our first COVID pause. Um, that was in March, it was March 24th of 2020. And uh, at first I thought, you know, we'd be off for maybe two to three weeks, you know, it'd be like, when everybody forgets to get their flu shot and then everyone goes back and gets their flu shot and you know, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Um, it turned out to be actually six months before we were able to resume the run and probably two months in, I thought, you know what, we're, we're in this for the long run. I need to call up tandem. I need to get switched over to control IQ. Hmm. So um, following that, I mean, my control was better, but it was an incremental change. Um, it, it was already doing a pretty good job. And I feel like part of the reason for our success was that, but a great deal of it was the fact that, you know, by the time we got to El Paso, I literally knew what it was like to run across Texas already. And I just ran across Texas again, but this time smarter. Mm -hmm. And it, the terrain was familiar. My stress level was lower. Leslie had learned lessons about what, I, what kind of fueling I should be doing. Uh, she actually kept a log of how many grams of protein I got. Um, we, I drank a lot of whey shakes. Um, I, uh, I ate hummus and chicken salad and things like that, along with, you know, the Oreos and tacos and stuff like that, whatever we could make on the camp stove. And um, it was just kind of old home week. We had been there before. We sort of knew what to do. It doesn't mean we did it perfectly, um, but I didn't experience a lot of control problems. Mm. Um, what I thought you were going to ask me about was, can you tell me a happy story or, or an uplifting story about, about what some of the running was like? And I, I do have one that I thought was kind of interesting. Sure. Um, most of the people that I know who have run, run or walked across the country say that it's, uh, there are three components to it, the, the physical endurance piece, the uh, what happens to you psychologically? Uh, you know, do you have the resilience to keep going when your vehicle breaks down, when there is a severe thunderstorms, when roads close, the cops stop you and tell you get off this highway, you don't know what you're doing, uh, you name it, right? It's do you have the ability to bounce back or do you sulk off to your hotel room at the end of the night and go, well, I don't get to we'll ever get to finish. Mm -hmm. But the third one is kind of, a, I guess what I would call sort of a, um, almost a, a spiritual side to it. Um, I'm not a very, a very religious or spiritual person, but um, there's something that happens in the middle of it all somewhere where you begin to realize that just something like a hot shower is the greatest gift in the world. Um, waking up to see the sunrise when you were worried your sugar was going to kill you last night. Um, you, you appreciate the sunrise and you don't think about all the bad things that happened and what almost killed you. And I feel that after the US run, um, I'm a lot more prone to see what happened right with the day because I kind of had to find something that happened right every single day I was out there or it would have been hard to keep going for as long as we did, in including the pauses. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, I was gonna ask you something similar because um, I. I know I just drove across country to move to Arizona, but I was wondering about running across country 
and just that perspective, because I know the little running that I do, I mean, I just kind of run around the neighborhood and I've ran or I've drove through that neighborhood a hundred times, but running through it is a much different experience. You appreciate more of what's going on around you. You're more present. So I was just curious on your perspective of running across country, going, going through all these different terrains and just how amazing and how beautiful that is. Um, Well, it's funny. You should mention Arizona. Uh, to me, my two favorite states uh, to run through were Arizona and New Mexico. Um, it is beautiful beyond measure out there. Um, Arizona's roads were a little more challenging. The uh, canyon roads um, through uh, Patagonia and Sonoida were a little challenging. Um, the shoulders weren't bad. Um, near the Continental Divide, it got a little dodgy where it looked like they kind of uh, blew some limestone out of the way, paved a road and said, okay, we're done. <laughs> you know, put up some guardrails. <laughs> you know, if they can't run behind the guardrails, then they're not good stock. Yeah. Um, and uh, there were a couple of places like that that weren't my favorites. But honestly, um, in March, out in the desert, you're well past the monsoon season. It's not hot yet. And man, it, it's everything is just awake and alive. And if you're paying any attention at all, you know, you can you can really see some awesome stuff out there that just fills you with joy and wonder. Yeah, that yeah. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering because um I was just thinking about how like I've been going on a few hikes lately and and just <laughs> being able to savor like the, the beauty and the nature and everything is pretty awesome. Somebody asked me what music I listen to when I'm running. And I said, are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> I listen to nature, man. There you yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not an aging hippie despite looking like one, but I mean, it is awesome out there. Yeah. There's, oh, yeah. there's a, there's a huge world out there to experience and most of us don't ever get to see the, the beautiful part of it. Yeah. So when you're running these distances, are you, uh, I was like, you just said, I, I assume you had no music, but I'm glad you clarified, you know, that's a long time to be with yourself and be with nature and be with, you know, the country. Um, what are, do you find yourself in like a, a, so a trance state? Like how do you pass the time of 33 miles a day every day for weeks and then starting and stopping and, you know, what, how does that, how does one even do that for the non runners who are listening to this podcast? Um, there's a couple of things. One is that um, I do have a cue sheets, um, you know, turn by turns. Mm. And uh, in an area where there are turns, it's easy to focus my attention on, okay, what's coming up? You know, how far to the shell station? All right, we turn left on the main street there. Then how far? Um, when you're out in the middle of nowhere, um, El Paso to Carlsbad. Um, <laughs> you're out in the middle of nowhere and there really aren't that many landmarks. You do have a tendency to kind of uh, drift into a state of, I guess what I would call slowed attention. Uh, it's really hard to zone out entirely with trucks coming at you, but it's almost like it becomes so routine and you become so inured to the practice of stepping off uh, the shoulder into the weeds when they come by that it's second nature and you don't do anything else other than that. And meanwhile, your thoughts wander. And what I have found is that that can be a dangerous thing. Mm. Um, there have been a few times where I got a long stretch of wide shoulder. The temperature was good. The sunlight was good. Um, you know, I was singing Jethro Tull songs to myself. And, you know, I'd be halfway through locomotive breath. And the next thing I would see is just, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> semi truck blowing past me. And I'm like, where the heck did that come from? And so it's bad uh, to let your attention drift. What I have found um, is that it's good to have 
something that regularly focuses your attention. And uh, I took up to looking on the side of the road for any interesting artifact. Uh, started out looking for money. I think I found two and a half dollars. Hey, hey. I know, I found a silver dollar in Montgomery, I believe it was. Oh, nice. and, did that uh, pay for the whole did that pay for the whole trip like the whole race yes, there you go that paid <laughs> that paid for everything that paid for all of my shoelaces uh it's funny because i just got contacted by a shoelace sponsor and i'm like oh baby wants new shoelaces yeah there um, you go <laughs> and uh but so you start um i started collecting washers when i couldn't find coins because it uses up just enough of your attention that it actually requires you to pay attention. You know, you, you have to look at the road uh, for the washers. You have to look at the road ahead of you. Uh, you know, you learn very quickly that just slight little glint of something, it's either a washer or it's broken glass. So either way, you need to be looking for it. And keeping your attention focused uh, turns into kind of a meditation rather than a trance. And uh, to me, it became very meditative to be out there for long distances, having something that required a small amount of my attention, but not enough to distract me from anything. And that's kind of how I got through the hours. Um, wow. Also, cheeseburger breaks. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to those. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've definitely been on a long run and all I've thought about is, man, a greasy cheeseburger, That's that would be the spot. <laughs> Boy, howdy. Come to Papa. <laughs> Well, you know, you think about junk food in the context of ultra running, mm -hmm. um, somebody, a famous person, but I'm not good with names, said that uh, ultra running is, is basically an eating contest with a little running thrown in. <laughs> and, nice. uh, you know, I'd, I'd say it a different way. Um, it's a best chance in the world to eat junk food and have it be just what your body needs. <laughs> um, you know, you dig into a cheeseburger you know, maybe drop half the bun because that's a good 50 grams of carbs. And if you don't need 50 grams, you don't need 50 grams. Right. But, you know, all that fat and salt and a little bit of carbs and protein. I mean, it tastes a lot better than a whey shake to me. I, right. I still like whey shakes, but, mm -hmm. you know, darn if cheeseburgers don't taste better. Yeah, right. <laughs> Oh, I'm no, sure no. I just I just t ticked off a bunch of vegans out there, and <laughs> I love you and I appreciate you, but Og still want cheeseburger. Yeah, <laughs> We're, you're amongst good company here. No, okay, no good, forms good. In between the three of us. <laughs> good. Um, so you mentioned, uh, you know, some of the dangers while on the road. You know, yeah. of not paying attention. I mean, you share some <laughs> good successes about um, your blood sugar. What? What in your mind was maybe the the scariest moment in terms of your blood sugar on, on the on this most recent run across the United States? To be honest, I don't remember one that was scary. Oh, um, wow. And that's scary in and of itself. Oh. Um, I sort of expected a severe low at some point. Mm -hmm. And there were many nights when my sugar felt normal. And, you know, I'm used to that little bit of a sugar buzz right before I go to bed. And the fact that it felt normal kind of bothered me, but mm. nothing bad ever happened. Um, I didn't even have severe drops that were only caught by uh, the T-Slim. Um, mm. I just didn't have them. I had a few days where, uh, especially any day where the miles were over about 35 or 36, which weren't a bunch, uh, maybe 10 total in the whole run, where, um, my sugar ran high um, or my blisters were bothering me and I could tell it was it was blister day because my sugars were were spiking in the middle of the afternoon. I wasn't particularly hot or dehydrated. And uh, I thought, oh, gosh, what am I going to do about this? You know, if, if I dose it down, you know, am, am I going to get away with dosing? Do I need to dose and eat? You know, what's going on here? This is the stress situation I ran into in uh, Iowa and, and again in Texas. And um, but it. It, nothing bad ever happened. Um, mm. Just kind of sat there and waited. And almost always it was because somewhere I had eaten a little too much fat or I just needed to sit down and my sugar kind of normalized either because of the pump or because of the reduction of the stress. Mm. And uh, I was more scared that bad things would happen than actually did. Mm. And 
I don't know. I guess I got lucky this time around. Um, I think if I had had some more dangerous bridge crossings or something like that, it would have been different. Nice. Wow. So, so in those moments, you would you would just kind of take a break if it was like a stress thing. You would just take a break for a little while, and then you would resume running again, <laughs> or just take a break for the rest of the day. Uh, take a break just for the moment. Um, typical situation would be there might be a, a long guardrail uh, over a river, so no chance to you know go down into the low part of the land and run back up. Um, very narrow shoulder. Had to wait for a gap in traffic. The gaps were never that big. I'd find a gap that I thought was good. I would kick in a high gear and run like crazy, almost outrunning myself. Get to the guardrail just as the car came came up. Step over the guardrail into God knows what, you know, weeds, broken glass, and I would just kind of sit there going, <laughs> "Oh my God," you know. And uh, moments like that, it. You know, you can't run like all heck is broken loose and then slow down and, you know, kind of be mellow. <laughs> you, you've got to kind of sit down and soak mm -hmm. up Yeah. just how hard that was in the moment and give yourself a break. I think far too many people who do long distance uh, don't give themselves breaks and they either end up injured or psychotic by the time it's all over with. Yeah, that's... um. I think you summate that really well, you know, when it comes to stress and hyperglycemia and running, um, it becomes a self-fulfilling loop of it being a physiological stress and then a mental stress of you trying to run it at makes that it worse. level. What's that? It makes it worse to add the mental stress to the cycle, to the uh, physiological stress. So most people, most runners, because runners are crazy, will just try to push through and opposed to taking the step back that, that you yeah. have mentioned and just riding it out and then continuing again. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really good lesson for a lot of people. Cause I was going to ask you, you know, how did, would you handle on these runs? If you woke up with a pretty high blood sugar, if it was in the two hundreds plus, <laughs> you know, um, I found you just kind of have to wait till the blood sugar stabilizes, even if that's a few hours to start the run. But it uh, sounds like if that's happening during the run or before, you probably do the same thing as well. Um, actually, I took whatever sugars I got and, and ran with it unless oh. it was a medical emergency. Okay. Um, it was painful to do sometimes. Mm. Um, typically what I would do and this was so counterintuitive for me, but it worked in Iowa, was that, you know, if my sugar is running high um, because I ate too much, well, then just run it off. Uh, if my sugar is running high because I didn't dose enough, then, then dose a little more. If it's running high because of stress, eat something, you know, anything in my stomach, you know, hummus, string cheese, it doesn't matter. Just get something inside my body so that my body can decide it's not being chased by that cheetah anymore and dose a little bit, mm. you know, it's okay to dose for protein and fat. Um, mm -hmm. you kind of got to be careful because it's a bit of a guessing game and there aren't any hard, fast rules for it, mm -hmm. but you got to eat and dose. You can't just dose um, mm. because you're basically starving your body at that point and telling it that whatever energy is on board is not to be used for running. It's to be used for storing, uh, glucose in the muscles in the liver. And uh, when you're running, it doesn't like to do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. It wants that energy available and you, you, you can't just blow through it. Um, you gotta, you know, you can't take days off because your sugar was a little, little out of whack. Um, I mean, if it's at the point where they would have taken you to the ER had you not acted uh, uh, swiftly, then yeah, I mean, take a, take a rest day. Mm. Um, but if it's not an ER situation, if it's the kind of thing you'd normally dose and wait a few hours, you know, just add running to that and do your best. I know a lot of people would say, no, you're not supposed to run when your sugar's over 250 or whatever. It sucks and it feels bad and it, and it hurts. But if you've made the commitment to run and you've got people that you're meeting, I think there's room enough there for, for flexibility in the strategy and, you know, maybe walk some. You know, walking for half an hour will drop your blood sugar and you're still three miles closer to the next town. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I think you got to kind of be flexible. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I mean, that's kind of how I approach things, but I don't run near as far as you do, but like if my blood sugar is really high and I want it to come down quicker than if I just bolus, I'll just go for a run real quick and it knocks it down and then boom, it's nice and level for me. Yeah. And it, it doesn't feel unpleasant for all that long. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I look at it this way. If it's going to feel unpleasant, it's going to feel unpleasant. Yeah. And you could be feeling unpleasant, sitting in an, an easy chair, not able to keep your legs from, from twitching. Or you can go out and let them twitch like crazy and every, let everybody think you're just running in a weird way. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, you know, your legs are going to move. You might as well put them to use. Yeah, there you go. That's, um, I think that's really telling of um, your personality and, and your drive. Uh, and how you approach both diabetes and life, you know, um, and one of the interviews that I read from with you was on Yahoo. And you said something along the lines that, um, you know, you were very close at one point in your life from um, looking at running and looking at diabetes and look going the wrong way in the fork in the road yeah. and becoming a victim of diabetes. And uh, what, what did you, what does a victim of diabetes mean to you? And, and what does the other side of the fork actually look like? Um, like a lot of type ones, even to this day, it's, um, it's very tempting to feel like, you know, you got handed a bag of worms when everybody else got candy and, um, that's legitimate. Um, nobody asked for this disease and it's okay to feel bad about getting it. But if you entertain uh, that feeling of justifiable indignation and uh, upset for too long, um, it becomes the object of your focus. Hmm. And the very things that you wanted that you feel were taken away by the disease will be taken away by the disease at some point in the future if you, you don't sort of meet it on its terms. Mm. Um, I'm a uh, uh, long distance swimmer as well. And uh, one of the things that uh, my swim uh, buddy and uh, training partner, Scott, likes to say is that the water does not judge and the water does not forgive. And I feel like type one is the same way. You know, type one is not looking down over its shoulder going, you're a bad boy today. You had bad glucose control. You know, you're not going to make it. You can't handle this. Mm -hmm. um, it's not saying that. You're saying that. And I think it's important to realize you can also um, will yourself into a state of mind where you view it like any other problem and needs to be broken down into pieces. And yes, the stakes are higher. And yes, if you screw up badly, you might not wake up again tomorrow. So be careful. Um, but giving up, what good will come of that? Mm. And uh, I was for the longest point, for the longest uh, time, consumed with this idea that I didn't deserve to be treated this way by life. And I was going to have my revenge by basically eating at Cheesecake Factory. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it reminds me of, um, I think it was an old Mad Magazine cover where uh, um, this guy had a cartoon of this guy pointing a gun at a dog's head and said, buy this magazine or the dog gets it. Um, I don't remember it, that one. I think I've seen yeah, that. Yeah, it was a classic. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, it's kind of it's kind of a, a false perspective. Mm -hmm. This idea that um, by you can get back at diabetes by hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a thing. It's a situation. Um, compare it to a bad day at work or surviving a car accident or mm -hmm. having to have a liver transplant. You don't see people going, well, you know what? I'm just not going to take my anti-rejection drugs. I'm going to die tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few people who do that. And, and, and God bless them. I, I feel for their suffering. But mm -hmm. that's not a way out. 
Right. Um, and I guess I kind of felt like I had been shown what my options were um, when I was told about the proliferative retinopathy that I had. Um, and they said at, at, at that time, uh, it was a few years back, the laser treatment was the um, recommended uh, clinical best practice, I guess. I guess now they, they do uh, an anti-inflammatory anti injection in the eye, um, Lucentis or something like that. Um, and um, maybe that's the company, I don't know. But mm. back then, you know, they lasered, uh, they laser coagulated the blood vessels that were leaking um, lipids in, into the eye. And you get a little burn spot in the back of your retina that you never got to see out of again. And one little burn spot, it's pretty easy to kind of, you know, it's like looking at a star. They don't show up when you look right at them, but you look to one side and they twinkle. Um, but this prognosis that if I didn't change something, that it was going to be a lot more little blind spots until the cure for, for not going blind from diabetes was going blind from laser treatments. And I kind of felt like, you know what, it was, it's still scary to go out and be physically active. Um, I have better tools now than I had before, but I have more knowledge than I had before. But it's much better to face that demon than to run straight into the arms of complications. And I guess I kind of felt like either way it could go bad, but I would take my chances on exercise. Mm -hmm. And that was a big decision for me because I was that diabetic who was scared uh, and sort of expletive here was that I would die in my sleep. And, you know, I, that's still something that, that crosses my mind off and on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, sooner or later, everybody dies. And you just kind of don't want it to be for stupid reasons. And you do your best you can, best you can to manage things. Wow. That was a, a beautiful answer and almost like expose on, on, what it means to, you know, live with diabetes and not against it. Um, yeah. Or choosing not to live with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I'm glad you guys get it. Um, that means, that means a lot. Well, it's like, you, I feel like, especially if you have a CGM, but even if you don't um, being diabetic, you're literally looking at your, your number all the time. And it's literally, a game like if it was a video game that is a number that if that hits zero it's it's game over and so as a diabetic you're you're always looking death in the face and like you said we're all gonna die it's just most people don't think about death as much as maybe a diabetic has to yeah and, and it's almost like if you're gonna if you're <laughs> gonna die you know like why not lean into it and try to live the best life you can and exactly. manage it and live with it opposed to ignoring it and feed and making a self-fulfilling cycle and prophecy. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, the people that love you and care about you want the best for you. And it's in a way it's punishment to them to mm. seek an outcome that, you know, will go badly. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe that puts you out of your pain, but it doesn't put them out of theirs. And uh, I don't know. I, uh, I, I don't know that I'm uh, qualified to go into into the thoughts of what is mentally healthy and what's not. But, mm -hmm. you know, I know, as you guys do, that living with it, that you have to make a decision. I don't want to say take charge because that makes it sound like somebody's walking in with cowboy britches and, and the new sheriff in town. Mm -hmm. But accepting responsibility, I think, mm -hmm. for at least the things that you do. Right. And accepting that the things that you have no control over, you don't have control over. Right. Yeah. It's, um, you know, taking charge, yeah, taking responsibility, I think is, is, is a theme of it. And I was even, um, talking with a patient today about it. Cause he was asking me about my insulin pump and things like that. And, 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 you know, owning, owning up to what you can and what you can't and, almost acknowledging what you can't control is almost as empowering as owning up and take responsibility of what you can. Cause then it gives you the freedom to say, <laughs> it's just not up to me and takes the stress off. You say it's like, <laughs> there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. I uh, once told a friend that um, I figured out that stress, <clears throat> at least psychological stress 
comes from an incomplete ability to influence outcomes. Um, and by that, I mean, if you have the complete ability to influence outcomes, you determine the outcomes, then why are you stressed? I mean, you're in control. Mm -hmm. If you have no ability to influence the outcome, why would you be stressed? You're not in control. <laughs> right. It's when you're somewhat in control and you're supposed mm -hmm. to be doing something and you don't know what it is, mm -hmm. that people feel kind of stressed out about things. Right. And, um, you know, that's the hard part. Um, diabetes sets the expectation that there's something you're supposed to be doing and your endo is pretty sure that's not what it is, <laughs> you know, whatever it is you're doing. Um, <laughs> you're, you're pretty sure that that's what it should have been, but it didn't give you the outcome you wanted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your buddies are like, I don't know, what did you do? I don't know. Ask, ask Susan, what'd she do? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you kind of arrive at consensus uh, by consensus at what a practical standard is for best practices in diabetes management. And as my wife likes to say, that's a hell of a way to run the railroad. <laughs> wow. Um, so this is almost then, you know, kind of backwards because we're almost like digging into the good lessons now. And then this question is kind of going before you learn those lessons. But, sure. uh, you know, prior to you in your 40s and kind of taking control and, and, and accepting the risk of exercise as, you know, when you got you know, the, the retinopathy diagnosis at that point, you know, what was diabetes like to you as a child and, and it's growing up in your adult life at that time, you know, the technology um, at that time is significantly different than the teens now that get to grow up with the T slim and everything like that. So yeah. how, how did you view your diabetes then and compare that to now? Um, that's a great question. Um, for reference, Someone told me, I guess, that the first practical home glucose meters uh, became available in 1975. That seems early to me. Uh, I got my hands on my first uh, Ames glucometer in 1982. Oh, wow. um, and it was a technological wonder. That was the size, shape, and weight of a brick. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember having to get insurance for it because they sold it to me for 300 bucks and um, I didn't want something to go wrong with it. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the first exposure I had to um, home glucose meters. When I was growing up, I was diagnosed at age 12. So I spent uh, all of my teen years and my high school years without any kind of home glucose monitor. Um, I had uh, urine tests that kind of told you what time of the day the horse got out of the barn, but it didn't really do anything to keep the horse in the barn. Mm. And um, so it wasn't much of a tool for managing things. Um, I had a handful of bits of advice that were probably clinical best practice at the time, but looking back on it, it's feel more like old wives tales. Um, my doctor said that because um, exercise drops blood sugar that I shouldn't do it. Wow. Um, he was afraid I would go low and end up in the hospital and they wouldn't know what to do uh, or that they wouldn't know what to do, but it would be way past the doing. And um, so he told me, literally told me not to exercise. Uh, somebody asked me if I was going to write a book about this, what would be the title? And I kind of jokingly said in reference to that, the title would be Don't Walk. <laughs> <laughs> kind of what my, what my endo told me at the time. And um, so growing up and being in high school, uh, it was the Wild West. Um, the only real indications I got that I was doing a poor job of managing my, gl my blood glucose was that um, you know, I'd be at the movie theater in the middle of a date and I would really have to go to the bathroom. Mm. Um, just, you know, sugar passing right through my kidneys. And, um, I would be very sleepy, um, by the end of the day. And, um, when I was in college, I would have some days where I didn't know exactly, uh, why, but, um, I would feel that I was brilliant at the beginning of the day and I would take good notes and I would get to my afternoon classes and I would practically sleep through them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was about the time that uh, a 
got to my sophomore year of college that I got my hands on a practical way to manage my blood sugar. And at that point, I had pretty much screwed up my grades. Um, I, I was paying no attention to glucose management. I was finally enjoying freedom and, you know, not having uh, my worrying mom looking over my shoulder, telling me what to do or what she thought I should do or what the doctor told me to do. And I got to tell you, man, it's, if I was a dog, I would be the dog that peed all over the carpet. I mean, I just, <laughs> I did a horrible job of managing things and, and I almost paid for it. Wow. Um, and I consider myself very lucky that I got the do over that I did. Mm. Yeah. I, I was almost wondering, you know, reading the interviews and preparing to meet you today. Um, so you've said so many times that it was, you know, the fear of exercise and, you know, I've never had an endocrinologist, uh, tell me not to exercise and, yeah, that's kind of deprecated these days, I think. Yeah, the, the script is flipped, thankfully, you know. Thank God, and, yeah. Um, but wow, what a what a crazy mindset uh, back then. Now, you know, just not even back then, a few decades ago, that medical community had for advice for this condition that was backwards, you know, excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, it was. And I uh, I look at the reasons for that advice and, I can sympathize with the fact that, mm -hmm. you know, even though insulin had come out, what is it, back in the late 20s, mm -hmm. that the tools for managing uh, diabetes were not great. Mm -hmm. I got the feeling that the reason that uh, people like Jocelyn and Lily gave out, gave out medals for surviving was because it was not likely. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's definitely a much better world now. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, it's a shame that so many more people are getting diagnosed. Um, I suspect there's some something going on immunologically behind that mm -hmm. um, that bears looking into. It isn't being looked at right now, but uh, at least we have the tools for managing it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the outcomes are a lot better. Oh yeah, and yeah, no. I uh, that's why it kind of scares me to see people, even with glucose meters and things like T Slim. Um, being afraid of their sugar dropping and instinctively trying to get it up to 180, 200 before they go, go for a run. Mm -hmm. I actually talked to a friend on a uh, Facebook friend just today who said that he went out and did a half marathon. Normally he eats keto, so he doesn't have a lot of variation in his blood sugars. Mm -hmm. And he felt like he was having a good day. Um, he uh, did not have a glucose meter with him and uh, perhaps an, an unfortunate accident. And uh, when he got to the end of the run, he was 400 uh, milligrams per deciliter. So wow. I'm not sure how to translate that in the millimoles off the top of my head, but he was high. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, uh, let's see, it's about, it's roughly 20, I don't know. Like I, about by two points something, I, if I remember. But. Yeah. Um, anyway, he was really high. And uh, he dosed to bring it down. Um, didn't consider the fact that um, he might be insulin sensitive at that point. Um, I mean, it's also equally possible that he could have had a spike afterwards, and maybe that's why he dosed so aggressively. But, you know, it's a bit of a Russian roulette thing, uh, mm -hmm. dosing heavily right after a run like that. Oh, yeah. Even if your sugar is high, because mm -hmm. it, it can drop like a rock. And uh, it did. And he was down to 20 within a couple of hours. Oh, wow. And, and I just kind of thought, how, how did that happen? You know, I'm not placing judgment, but as someone with the investigative mind of a, a, um, a type one who's curious about exercise and stress and, mm -hmm. and uh, the insulin and all the way all this mixed together, I had to wonder how he got in that situation. And all I can say is it was unfortunate. Um, mm -hmm. He told me he had something like 20 units of insulin on board. And wow. that's an incredible amount. Yeah. I, during the US run, that was my total daily dosage. Wow. And I just kind of thought, you know, this is a guy, this is a guy who is shooting in the dark with a high caliber rifle and ending up hitting himself sometimes. Wow. And uh, I'm not precisely sure I remember where I was going with that comment, other than to say that that um, 
you know, sometimes the strategies we come up with don't work. And I think we're all kind of aware of that. And maybe that's what scares us is that even with glucose meters, even with uh, things like control IQ and, and looping and stuff, that something will still go incredibly wrong. Right. And that was his day that day and he survived. So I guess that's a win. Yeah. No doubt about it. Um, it's easy to make a just slip up in one thing, you know, and it's so easy. Yeah. I, uh, easy my first, very first marathon that I ran was um, I, I did a good job of learning, starting to learn how to run with diabetes. And uh, but I got I just got nervous running my first race ever. And I, I just decided, screw it. And I took my pump off right before the race. Mm. And I was like 150 before the race. And I ended up in like the 400s by the end of it, too. And it's just like just one little quick thing that's not even related to your diabetes. <clears throat> the decision of just nervous for something can make change a decision and change everything else. And, you know, even with today's technology, that doesn't mean that the information is easily accessible to everyone, too. Um, we were, I think, two interviews ago, we uh, were interviewing Eric Zuccaro, who was uh, he's in his 30s and he's an Olympic weightlifter and does all these other things. And um, I think he said he was growing up on the, the East Coast and his endocrinologist at the time didn't deal with type one diabetes, only two. and was giving him all this whack advice, even like, you know, in the past 10 years. <laughs> and and it's, it's so easy to have misinformation, not in the correct information for you. And so with all these challenges, went back to the conversation we just had about, you know, taking responsibility, somebody could want to take responsibility, but not even have the right tools. So, yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's, well, a, real, also, that's a real challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's um, also hard, hard not to get emotional. And I, I'm sure in that case, because this happens to me too, where you see that really high number and it's just, it almost offends you to your core because you're like, how did I let myself get that high? Right. And then you just, what, what we call rage bullets and bullets yep. just to drive it down really fast. Yeah. Now I, uh, I think a good healthy dose of self-forgiveness uh, mm. goes a long way in dealing with the disease. Oh yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. So, you know, you've done this amazing run. You literally, is it a world, technically a world record that you broke? Um, you want the technical answer or the short answer? Oh, let's, let's go technical. <laughs> uh, technical answer is no. Okay. Um, the, there are two kinds of record keepers for runs of that distance. Uh -huh. uh, one is Guinness, uh -huh. uh, which has very strict um, rules for transcontinental records. Um, they must be between, across the U.S. anyway, must be between San Francisco and New York City or San Diego and New York City. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Um, and if someone knows that to be incorrect, um, please let me know. But I, I believe that's correct. Most people do San Francisco to New York City. Okay. Um, technically, it's not even a transcon because it isn't ocean to ocean. It's city hall to city hall. Mm. Um, there are a handful of safe routes that the people who have done it uh, have circulated amongst each other, but there is no standard route. Uh, it simply specifies that you must have a fully witnessed run from San Francisco City Hall to New York City City Hall or San Diego City Hall to New York City. And uh, by fully witnessed, they mean that uh, you have multiple GPS tracks. Um, you have an observer who is observing the entire run. And if he takes a potty break, then somebody else steps in and observes and signs an affidavit that says they were watching you the whole time. Wow. Uh, or you have a film crew that comes out and films everything but your visits to the bathroom. Um, that's one way of, of doing the records. Um, the other one is more of the honor system uh, through an organization called Fastest Known Time. And um, Fastest Known Time recognizes self-reported records with uh, what I call an, ab an abundance of data with some gaps allowed. Uh, and this is uh, to acknowledge the fact that many transcontinental runners uh, will get uh, signal dropouts, echoes in canyons. It happens a lot getting out of California. Um, 
in my case, I uh, was running from, uh, I believe I got this in the right direction, Nogales to Douglas, Arizona. And um, I was heading along a, uh, a road and tripped and fell on a bump in the asphalt and landed on the uh, connection in my uh, uh, live tracker that um, went from the battery, from the uh, charging port to the power supply, to the, uh, all the active parts of, of the machine. And it didn't show up right away as a problem because it had good battery. But when I went to charge it, it did not charge. Mm. Changed out the USB cable, did not charge. Changed out the power supply, did not charge. And uh, sent it back to Garmin and said, you've got to overnight me another one. I'm, I'm trying to document a record here. And they did. They, they sent me one within a day. And they got back and said, I don't know how you did this, but you disconnected the electronics from the power supply uh, in such a way that they ran while the battery was connected. But when, when you put the charger on, uh, it's, you know, they're basically saying that they had tested it with a good charger of theirs and the, the, the tracker did not charge. Mm. So um, the, the fastest known time people allow for dropouts uh, of equipment and stuff like that, provided that you can uh, supply them with timestamp selfies that show that you were at the place you would have been if you had actually run there um, or witness reports, um, any you know, stuff like that. And um, the problem with trying to document it as a fastest known time is that broadly speaking, fastest known time acknowledges only ocean to ocean or one side of a state to another side of a state. Uh, and there was no way I was gonna break Pete Kostelnik's transcontinental record. There was no way I was gonna set a Guinness record. And uh, I, I put the route up at fastest known time from Disneyland to Disney World. Um, they let me grandfather the route in um, because the rules have changed and they no longer allow um, what they call sub transcon routes unless they're uh, uh, records across the state. And um, basically said, you know, we changed our minds. Um, we're not going to acknowledge this record. That's a technical answer. Uh, not a record on fastest known time, not a record on Guinness. Um, it also took me 431 elapsed days, uh, nine hours and 57 minutes, which I could probably knuckle walk faster than that. Um, <laughs> that's COVID walks, uh, COVID pauses included. Mm -hmm. But it is a first ever run from Disneyland to Disney World. Um, it is documented to the same degree of standard as fastest known time requires. It's just not acknowledged as a fastest time because practically anybody could do it in less than 431 days. Sure. So there's your answer. Um, sorry, that's long winded, but now, you know, no, that's the, I mean, even that it's not documented in, in one of those two organizations. I mean, the, the fact that you went from Disneyland to Disney world as a type one, uh, even a, just that headline alone, well, is enough to say, yeah, uh, you did a freaking amazing thing that nobody's really yeah. ever done. Well, it caught uh, Disney's attention and, uh, uh, it caught a uh, Good Morning America and Inside Edition. So I think we're successful there. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about it. So, I mean, with such a huge win, you know, what's uh, what's next? I read that you're really not planning on doing something like this exactly, you know, in the yeah, future this, because it took this so long to plan. Yeah. Um, without going into my particular numbers, uh, I ran the numbers on the cheapest way you could run across the U.S. And uh, unless you've got an abundance of road angels, even pushing a baby carriage full of supplies, you're looking at three or $4,000. And we had a van and we had to buy that van for this run. And we mm -hmm. had to supply that van and it was considerably more than the, the, the cheapest way to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we would choose to spend that money to do another transcontinental run. Um, I have been looking at a swim, a solo swim around Key West uh, fortunately, um, fortunately, I don't have to worry about setting records there. Um, there's a lady, a type one lady who did it. I want to say back in the nineties, I don't remember what her name was. Wow. Uh, and then my good friend, Karen Lewin was the second type one to swim solo around Key West. Um, it's a regular thing for people to do. So, um, if anyone's going to 
set a record, it's probably not going to be me. Mm. But it's a hard thing. And, um, you know, I'm used to swimming, you know, maybe three or four miles at a time and tripling that distance is a challenge for me. Mm. And the good thing is that it's something I can practice for in my pool. And on the day of the swim, drive out and do it. And when that day is done and the sun has set, I'm done with it. Um, I'm not out on the road doing it for 90 days at a time mm -hmm. or 431 days at a time for that matter. And uh, it still seems epic, but it's kind of sized down to my budget and my time and my ability to train. So that's what I'm looking at doing next. Um, mm -hmm. I'm in no great hurry to get that done. Um, mm -hmm. I want to stay active, but I do that best when I have something in front of me that I'm working on. Sure. Well, I mean, if you're, your motto is don't go fast, go far, just do it twice. And there you go. You got the first dive bag to do it twice oh. in one, one sitting. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, somebody asked me when I got to Disney world uh, and they asked the question in, in the way that would have prompted the traditional answer. They said, uh, Don Muchow, you just ran from Disneyland to Disney world. What are you going to do now? Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, you know, I know you want me to say I'm going to Disneyland, but I just ran from there. <laughs> I'm not going to Disneyland right now. I'm at Disney World. I'm going to enjoy it here. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's funny you should mention that. Absolutely. Um, let's see, Grady, you got any other, you know, things you want to hit on? I think you um, covered a lot. But did you have more, Don, that you wanted to talk about? With this audience, I, I, I guess uh, all I would say is that um, – if you're already doing some kind of exercise, I don't want you to walk away with the feeling that, wow, well, it wasn't what this guy did. It must not count. That's self-destructive and that's, that's bad. That's bad talk. Um, I'm diabetic the same as you guys are. Um, I run into the same problems with highs and lows that you do. The only thing I have is more experience running across the country. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we learn. You know, we pick up experience. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking to yourself, well, I want to go get active. If um, I, you know, I want to start doing something. How do I do this? Um, you're more than welcome to contact me. My website's got a, an email address and Facebook stuff. You can get in touch with me, but talk to somebody. Um, there's a huge group out there called type one diabetic athletes that has people that do everything. Um, and somebody out there, is either knows more than you do or knows less than you do and wants to learn from you. And if all else fails, uh, Sherry Kohlberg has a book called The Diabetic Athlete and go pick up a copy of that at a used bookstore or something and uh, read it from cover to cover. There's so much information available right now that no one should have to wait um, 30 plus years like I did before deciding to be active. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Um, you know, I think that message is, is really consistent with, with your story and your being. And um, it's, I love that you are, that, that you tell people not to just realize that, you know, not to idolize you or say, this is a huge accomplishment, I can't do it. But, you know, if you can't, if you can't even imagine how to do something, you, you suggest giving back. And you already have suggested that there's somebody who wants to learn from you. Yeah, which is absolutely true. And I think that's a, not talked about enough. You know, it's, it's funny you should uh, put it in those words. Um, I think there's somewhere on my website, but um, people often have their initial reaction is, oh, my God, I could never do that. Mm -hmm. And without judging anyone, I really dislike that reaction because mm -hmm. that's negative self-talk. Yep. If somebody says, I don't know how I'm ever going to do that. Good. We got a conversation going. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Let's talk. Um, and I kind of feel like that's what needs to happen. Um, I don't want people to look at this and go, oh, that's really awesome. You know, he must have great genes and, and entirely misses the point. Um, yeah. I'm almost 60 years old. I waited 30 years to start exercising and I make mistakes. I'm a normal guy. And um, even normal guys like me, old normal guys who, um, you know, ended up getting lasered in the eye because they were in poor control. 
still have room enough to do things that are epic. And if they're not epic by other people's standards, then damn it, they're epic for you. And that's what matters. Mm -hmm. um, if you amaze yourself, you did right that day. Uh. If you failed, you learned something. There's no way you can lose. I love it. I love it. Um, well done. It's been an absolute pleasure getting to know you on this podcast. I, I have a feeling a lot of people, a lot of listeners will uh, find value in this because if they haven't stumbled upon you, I'm glad that they will through this. And um, you mentioned your, um, you know, your website. You mentioned, do you mind just saying it again by name? And we'll, we'll make sure to put it in the podcast notes. But sure. uh, how can people get in touch with you? Um, the website is um, t1determined.org. Um, you can reach me on email at donsolo at t1determined.org. Um, I believe it's got my, uh, if you just look for Don Mucho on Facebook, um, look for the one that's the athlete. Um, the other guy sits around with his buddies and drinks beer. Uh, that's not me. <laughs> No, he's probably a relative, so I need to be careful about <laughs> bad mouthing him. But uh, um, yeah, no, it's uh, I'm I'm the one who's the athlete, mm. and um, you know, friend me, contact me, um, you know, post something. I'm probably in one of the groups where it'll show up, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I would love love to chat with people who are who are interested in this sort of thing. Mm. Um, I would like conversations, not idolizers. Mm. Wonderful. Well, like I said, Don, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule and uh, sharing some, some wisdom and, and sharing just some community, which uh, I think we all, especially this past you know year and a half, two years really need. So thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure to have you on the Die Buddies podcast. Thank you, Garrett. And thank you, Grady. You guys have both been wonderful. Awesome. So to everyone else listening, thank you for tuning in and we'll catch you next time on the Die Buddies podcast. See ya. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you found value in today's conversation, we would appreciate it if you gave a five-star review. It really helps us branch out our community and get our message across to those who really need to hear it. If you want to interact with us on social media, you can follow us on the Die Buddies podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or if you have any questions, comments, concerns, or moral outrages, you can email us at thediebuddiespodcast at gmail.com. Thanks.